Hello everybody. Welcome to Our Community Access. I'm Chuck Cameron. This week, Terry visited with our township supervisor and county representative. And next, residents get a hearing test. And Oxford High School gets relief funds from a disc golf tournament. Next, Chief Sowal talks ice safety. And finally, Oxford Township Parks and Recs gives hearing relief. All today on Our Community Access. Recently, Terry met with Township Supervisor Jack Curtis and County Representative Mike Spitz to talk about county grants and some township updates. Let's watch. We're here at the Oxford Township Hall to discuss the grant funding that was provided by Logan County Board of Commissioners um, for the Oxford community. Um, late last year after the incident on November 30th, the Oakland County Board of Commissioners um, allocated $5 million from their, their fund balance for the Oxford incident. Uh, part of those funds were for the prosecutor's office. 500000 of that was for mental health for reimbursement for all the families, siblings, etc. Um, that went through this incident to help pay for their co-pays, etc. Because uh, with a lot of the other mental health programs that are out there, they have gaps within them. This is meant to fill one of those gaps. And then we also allocated $100,000 for the businesses here in Oak, oh, here in Oakland County, here in Oxford and Lake Orion, um, to help alleviate some of the pressures that were put on them during the time frame between November 30th and January 24th for all the great work they did to help support this community. Um, Oxford Township Board last night uh, approved the interlocal agreement with the county. A check will be issued to Oxford Township probably in the next week or so for that $100,000. Those monies will then be allocated to those businesses. Um, there will be a joint committee, I'll call it, that will be myself, Supervisor Curtis, Supervisor um, Barnett. Barnett out of Lake Orion. Sorry, I couldn't remember that one off the top of my head. Um, Joe Medora out of the village, and uh, Carolyn Krause from the county will have a sit down, review the information, and then come up with the outline on those facilities or those organizations that will receive some of these monies. Um, the outline of it is that it has to be a organization with under 50 employees. All right. It also can only be up to $5,000 as a max. So that group will sit down and review the information together to see how it all best fits for which organizations will receive the funding. At this point, and it's been something that's been done between a, a group of individuals that have worked very hard since the incident on November 30th. Um, including the Legacy Center, many of those individuals there, a lot of the local businesses, um, Supervisor uh, Curtis himself. Also, you know, what could we do to help some of these businesses out? Because a lot of them went above and beyond and put their businesses in jeopardy to a degree. So we, and of course, on top of COVID with everything else that's been going on. Um, so we want to make sure that um, we're here to support those businesses to make sure they're they stay within this community and continue to support this community. Um, the current strategy is going to be we're going to just going to go into those businesses and talk to them directly. So if you think about it, in the last couple years, they survived M24, redoing M24. On the heels of that was COVID. On the heels of that was the most devastating tragedy that none of us ever imagined could mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to say to those business owners that are still here? Thank you. Continue to stand strong. We'll support you where we can. Um, and if you need help, please, please reach out to us. I mean, we'll do what we can within the confines of the township in the county. Yes, we're here to talk uh, today about the grant monies that were allocated to uh, Oxford and Orion Township uh, restaurants, businesses here in our communities. Uh, who donated foods and services through the uh, last few months, the period of uh, November 30th to January 24th. Um, 
we're trying to give back to these local businesses who dedicated their time and efforts to support the community in time of need. Uh, what they gave to us was what they did not have ooh, an opportunity to make for themselves. Uh, they took their selflessness, gave it to the community in a time of need. So uh, through the county, working with uh, Mike Spiz and uh, Carolyn Krause, Dave Coulter's office, releasing some of the Oakland County funds, uh, we're going to give back to the businesses. We had, uh, through the course of this tragedy, we had restaurants donating food to the fire department, the police. Um, we fed the schools. Uh, they came back for three days and uh, the restaurants stepped up and fed the schools those three days, the teachers, the bus drivers, the uh, administrators, the cafeteria folks, whoever came in for those three days of meetings, we got restaurants donated their food and time. Uh, and it was a great step up. We had, uh, one morning I looked out the window and I had 25 dogs out my back window and I'm, I thought, oh my gosh, it's the hounds of Baskerville. What it was, was to ensure the safety of the schools. Uh, all the bomb dogs from around uh, lower Michigan, in fact, some up as far as Grayling, Michigan State Police, the uh, Tuscola County Sheriff, Eaton County, uh, all the uh, different authorities were out here. Well, when you bring that many people into your community, these restaurants stood up and fed them. C.J. Carnacchio is our grants and communications manager. I know that his desk is full of grant requests that were going out from anything from sanitary sewer lines to uh, economic redevelopment, economic preparedness for the future. Uh, we, we take advantage of uh, any opportunity that's given us, but hard work with our team members at Oakland County. That's how we won and we, we get this for our community. I don't see a dime of it. The township doesn't see a dime of it. It's going back to the community business people. So these grants we do chase and I say I chase the money here. That I don't chase it away. We, we go after it. We try to capture it and make it good for the community. Sure, North on 24. Um, during the M24 reconstruction, Oxford had the foresight of putting an 18-inch sewer main right down the center of M24. Uh, it goes, right now the sewer line is empty. Uh, it stops at the northern end of the village at Harriet Street, and what we want to do is uh, extend that sewer line north to the north. We have um, a couple of subdivisions that have septic tank issues going on that we're uh, trying to prepare ourselves to address. We also have commercial and industrial properties to our north that uh, the only reason they are not developed to the extent that they could be is the fact that they are still on septic. Sanitary sewer is very important. Uh, not having to have a septic feel, well isolation zone, your building can be bigger, you can have more employees. Uh, most of the businesses to the north are, a lot of them do heavy military contracting, uh, for anything from casting engine veins to machining those engine, jet engine veins. And uh, it's precision work, it's high quality, high paying jobs. And uh, in order to address the future needs of the industrial society, we are trying to sewer that. So last night at the board meeting, we had our first resolution pass to uh, put the special assessment district in where the landowners will pay for the sewer to be put in. So we're going to put in about 6,500 feet of uh, sanitary sewer line to the north and it will be paid for by the property owners. Uh, from that point north to Davison Lake Road, we are going after grants through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and chasing their money. It's, uh, I believe it's called serviceability for the future, uh, taking these large vacant parcels of land and preparing them for future industry. We are very concerned about our aquifers. We have the Paint Creek, we have the Flint River, we have a lot of water 
uh, that services the entire Oregon community, Oxford community, uh, the wells, the private wells. So this sanitary sewer line ensures that future development is done removing the sewage from our area and not allowing it to be into those aquifers. Uh, currently, uh, we have some septics that were put in in the 1920s in cottages and now uh, families live in them full time and it's stressing them. So to prepare ourselves to protect our environment, we are seeking grants and we're seeking landowner uh, companions in this project and we were happy to uh, get our first step kicked off last night. Uh, the status of, of, of a hospital in Oxford. In 2018, it was identified Oxford had a local access area need. Uh, we had two people step up and bid for that need. One was not awarded a CON, one was told they were the only one there. They proceeded with millions of dollars in investments procuring the land, architectural. We worked through the, our planning commission up until their February of 2020 meeting. We had a Beaumont hospital coming here. Uh, when the pandemic hit in March, uh, things changed dramatically. Uh, Beaumont, the hospital that was coming here, you know what they were doing, taking care of all the patients from the pandemic. Uh, they put their program on the back burner and in the meantime the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services said that we no longer qualified it for the need. So now in 2022 uh, I'm addressing this through the uh, Lieutenant Governor's Office, Garland Gilchrist, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, and I have three liaisons working from their office and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to review our request again. Uh, since the 2019 study, the rules were changed. And unbeknownst to us, our area is no longer in an area of need based on the changed rules in the study. So starting March 17th, um, is there one of their meetings, I'm gonna go up there and address uh, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and quite frankly, be honest with them, 20 minutes to a hospital, lights and sirens is is totally unacceptable. This area is growing. Not only is our area growing, areas to our south are growing, causing more and more traffic. Traffic impacts are not recorded in the ESRI data because of M24 being shut down. Uh, the years in 2018, we showed almost 34,000 passbys per day in Oxford. With M24 shut down, our drainer road passbys was down to like 20,000. Well, you can't use that number against us in, in qualifying an area for a need. It still takes us 20 minutes, lights and siren, to get to a hospital. It still takes an ambulance out of our community for two hours. It still causes us to have full-time paramedics, advanced life support qualified paramedics because it is so far to the hospitals. And uh, this, this is a hamper on us. It costs us more money, number one. Number two, there's a shortage of EMTs. There's a double shortage of paramedic, advanced life support paramedics. So it's hampering us all around. We have data that shows we're 16.2 miles to the closest hospital. I don't know of anybody that wants to have a heart attack, let alone be shot and have to be transported to a hospital that's almost 17 miles away in rush hour traffic based on data that was skewed by a, a construction project, skewed by people working at home, and now all of a sudden we don't need it. We had two years of proof we needed it. So I'm gonna go up there and fight the fight on March 17th, and I do remain in contact with the three governmental uh, aides that are supposed to help me along with it. Next, Oxford Parks and Rec hosted an Oxford High School Victim Relief Disc Golf Tournament, and our own Dan Zweiss was there.
So we have uh, the raffle also going on today. We've got a lot of items donated by people from all across the community. Um, just an unbelievable amount of stuff came pouring in for us for this raffle. That was going on up at the Senior Center here in the front of Seymour Lake. That's going on from 8 to 6. And we'll do all of our drawings after that and get all these amazing prize packs out to people. And I just can't thank the community enough really for all the outpouring of support, all the stuff that was donated, just everything really. It's, it's really awesome that everybody was able to donate so generously for such a good cause. So it, it really makes me happy and I'm super happy I was able to get a lot of uh, a lot of really solid volunteers, some of my good friends and stuff to help me out here. Hey, how's it going everyone? My name is Kyle Curtis, coming up here today from Hazel Park, Michigan. As you can see, it's super cold out today, but it's beautiful and sunny. We're ready to support the Oxford community and uh, throw some discs and do what we do. Thanks for, uh, for coming out and supporting. So basically the night of the incident, um, my family and I are huge disc golfers and I actually reached out to a bunch of pro companies, different pros, and uh, sent them an email out to see if they donate a raffle so we could raise funds for uh, families in need for this uh, incident. And uh, graciously enough, all the pros, everyone donated everything for free. Um, we got over probably 2,000 different disc golf items, local shops around Oxford donated very generously. and. Um, We've been playing for a while and I figured it's the least we could do for a time like this. So this is very exciting and um, we're looking pretty good right now. So very awesome stuff. Next, because spring is springing, Joe Hewitt caught up with Village Police Chief Mike Sowald to talk about ice and lake safety. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chief Michael Solwald with the Oxford Village Police Department. Today we're going to talk briefly about some ice safety. This time of year it's about mid-March. It uh, gets a little sketchy as far as how strong the ice is and how safe it is for people to be out on it. We've had a pretty cold season this year so uh, the ice was able to get pretty thick for us this year but when the weather starts to change and it starts to get uh, you know above 30 40s 50s and then back down again it can get a little sketchy as far as uh, the consistency of the ice and how solid it is usually if it's three inches or thicker it's safe to walk out on um, so testing that and walking out and making sure that that's three uh, three inches at least for you to walk out on and ice fish um, or to just simply walk on uh, things to look for is you can see some dark areas where it looks kind of moist uh, where it looks like it's kind of melted a little bit those are areas you definitely want to avoid um, little cracks obviously um, valleys uh, slush um, you want to stay away from uh, just looking at this it doesn't look safe to me to be out on um, so it's a good idea this time of year to get your ice shanties off the uh, lakes just so they don't uh, the ice doesn't melt and then it falls in and then you lose your ice shanty or that's not at the bottom of a, of a lake or pond. Um, obviously the biggest thing is what we're looking for is safety. Um, again this time of year um, with the warm and, and uh, cold weather back and forth it just simply isn't safe to, to be out on the ice but again if it's three inches or thicker it's safe to go out onto. Um, if you run into a situation you're out on the lake and you are out walking around um, and you feel like it's you feel like you're starting to the ice is starting to crack um, It's always suggested that you Get down and you just kind of don't stand but actually get down on the ice and just kind of crawl your way back instead of having all your weight uh, as you're standing um, If you see somebody that looks like they need assistance uh, if you're standing like we are here today um, Somebody's out there um, first and foremost call 911 
Uh, we'll get the fire department out here and the police department and we'll do what we need to do to get that person to safety. Um, it's always a risk when you try to go out there and try to help somebody on the ice because you will also fall in the water with the rest of them. Um, but do what you can, grab a stick, grab something that you can get to them with. Um, if, if it's necessary, then you yourself, you can kind of lay down on the ice and kind of just crawl up to them and try to get a stick to them as best you can. Not putting yourself at danger as best you can, um, but trying to get to that person so you can bring them into safety. And then when they do get closer, then they can roll up onto shore instead of standing up and distributing all that weight to where they're going to fall into the, uh, to the weak areas of the ice. I don't think you can tell until you get out there and start to um, gauge uh, the thickness of the ice. But for me, it's not worth the risk because looking at it, and if I go out here and I think it's safe, I don't know how far I've got, how much thickness I've got to where it's not thick. So, and again, this time of year, it's not worth the risk. Best thing you can do is to drill a hole and take a, um, um, a ruler and uh, gauge it that way. The only problem with that is, is it might be three inches thick here and not three inches thick there. So that's the only concern I have, especially this time of year, because there's so many weak areas, uh, depending on where you're at on the lake or the pond. Looking at this right now and seeing some of the, the dark ridges and, and uh, valleys and slush, it doesn't look safe at all for me. Um, it definitely would not be a risk that I would take, so I would hope nobody else would take that risk. So I, it's my best advice is just not to be on the ice this time of year. Um, start to prepare yourself for spring. Good advice. And finally, Terry caught up with some hearing specialists at the Senior Center. Let's listen. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I was excited about uh, getting told they might maybe have hearing loss, but yeah, we do it as a community service just to raise awareness because oftentimes uh, hearing is, is pushed to the side for other problems or not recognized, uh, especially in the senior community. So it's it's just it's very important to find hearing loss quickly and, and provide treatment if, if need be. Um, this will determine if an if, if, uh, individual has uh, any hearing loss at all, and then we further can dive in deeper in the office to determine the type of hearing loss and the, and the path to go down for, for treatment. If there is a mechanical problem or it's more of a nerve damage type thing that can be treated through things like hearing aids. Yeah, so we, we treat mainly um, sensory neural hearing loss, which is usually due to the aging process, loud noises that we see in many adults especially seniors. Um, as you age, the, the nerve endings start to deteriorate and they need a little extra oomph to receive that stimulation. So um, that's normally what we treat, um, what we call more of a mixed hearing loss or um, a middle ear type of hearing loss. We may refer out to an ear, nose and throat physician to have looked into. Um, it, it could be a, a, a lot of different reasons. Could be a trauma, could be a tumor, uh, infections, uh, any kind of situation that happened at birth. So usually those situations are recognized earlier in life. Um, for many adults over the age of 55 or 60, uh, usually a sensory neural hearing loss is more of a natural um, type of problem. We're on Clarkston Road and M24 on the uh, northwest corner. Your telephone number is 248-845-4714. You can visit us at professionalhearingclinic.com. We have an office in Lake Orion and in Davison. Well, thank you for coming no to this community. Thanks for having us. So first of all, through the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, it states every American has the right to a fair and equal way of communicating. So because of that, this is funded through a federal program, so there is no cost to people getting our phone. So this is a huge resource for people that have a hard time hearing on the phone. And they can get it whether they have hearing aids or not. As you know, sometimes people don't want to admit they have hearing loss. Sometimes people feel, I can't afford hearing aids. So the phone, whether they have hearing aids or not, they are entitled to a phone, which will help them communicate more effectively. Do they have to have a... a, um, a existing phone already? They do need a phone number and it can be a cell phone or a landline and I say that because a lot of people now get rid of their landlines most people only have cell phones so their cell phone actually pairs to our phone so when their cell phone rings at home our phone will also ring and if they need the amplified volume in the captions 
then they just engage with our phone and they can make both inbound and outbound calls. And I keep saying captions, but I do want to explain what captions are. Captions are the words that are coming across the screen here. So if I had a hard time hearing on the phone, everything that's being said to me will be displayed word for word on this screen. And you can adjust the font size. You can see there's a little button here. You can change how big the words are. So if you have macular degeneration or other vision issues, they take that into account as well. We have the three different models here and it's personal preference of what you like. This one has all the bells and whistles. These are more straightforward. And the only difference between these two is the size of the screen. And we bring them to your home. We install them, we show you how to work them, we give you a little tutorial, we make practice calls, and we get you comfortable and confident using this phone. And if you do have a landline, all your other phones in your home are up and running. This is just an additional phone to use. And your phone number stays the same. It's a Wi-Fi, it, it, um, Bluetooth? Bluetooth, well, it depends how you get your dial tone. So if you have a landline, we would plug into a jack. If your cell phone, we would Bluetooth the devices to each other. And then you do need internet for the captions and we can use wireless internet or hardwire into your modem or router. And we also have a non-internet caption phone for people that don't have internet. <laughs> so there are, well, some people are in rural areas or some people that just don't feel they have the need for internet for whatever reason and we try and help everybody we really do so we like to come to events like this because if you're getting your hearing screened and tested and you see this resource and you need it we will happily get it for you so how do they qualify great question how do they qualify they qualify by having some degree of hearing loss and we do not have to have like a test results we just need a third party to verify you have hearing loss oh. so yeah so it can be Adam it can be your primary care doctor it can be a nurse it can be a social worker it can be a veteran service officer so there are all these different people that can verify that you would benefit from having this phone and then how do they get in touch with you to get that what do they have to do to make it happen sure so I will give my phone number which is 248 five five zero six eight six six you can call me or text me and we would get you a form which looks like so hold on this and this is the form that gets completed the top portion is your name address and phone number the bottom portion is what the certifying professional fills out once that's completed you'll have your phone within a few days. It, it happens like that. And this is all um, CapTel, is that part of AT&T? Who is CapTel? It's a good question. So CapTel, we provide and manufacture the captioned telephones, mm -hmm. so the device itself. Mm -hmm. And these captioned phones are actually made in Madison, Wisconsin. And we are the only CapTel manufacturer that makes their phones in the United States, and that's very important to us. We're very proud of that fact. Yes, and so that's why we, additionally we can get them so quickly to the end user. Oh, right. sure. of course. So we don't provide phone service. I just want to be perfectly yes. clear. We don't provide the phone service and you, the user still pays their cell phone bill or their landline bill, but and there is no cost no for the phone. no additional charges per month? Nothing. Free. Wow. This is available in all 50 states because it's a federally funded program. Mm -hmm. You also can get these phones in your places of work if you have trouble hearing at work. Well, thank you for spending time. Well, this moment. Um, I really appreciate it. well, I love what I'm super passionate about I what I do. See. I love it. I love it so much. I've seen, oh, wow. I've seen people's faces light up. I've seen wow. the most amazing first phone calls of siblings that haven't talked in years. Goosebumps. <laughs> Um, so if we can be of service, please reach out to me. And thank you for, well, thank you for that's all the time we have for this edition of Our Community Access. I'm Chuck Cameron, and thanks for watching.